Welcome to Bonroom Capital Management's What's the Alternative podcast. Join host Shana orzik Sissel, the queen of alternatives and founder and CEO of Bonroom Capital Management as she interviews leaders in the alternative investment space. Learn more about their firms, their passions, and about the many different ways investors can use alternative investments to add value in their investment portfolios. Hello, everyone. I am Shana Sissel, founder and CEO of Bonnery and Capital Management, and this is What's the Alternative? And today we have with us Steve Zushkin. Yes, wrong. Is that right? <laughs> wrong. I, you know, still I've known close. Steve for a while now, and I still can't pronounce his last name correctly, and it shouldn't be this hard. No, um, I, I love it, Shana, and you're not alone. And this is like a highlight because I use it as an opportunity to uh, get a laugh and have fun with people when I meet them. So it's Zushin. Okay. Well, I, I relate. <laughs> My maiden name is also very hard to say. And Give it for to us. some Give it to reason, us. nobody likes to uh, say my first name correctly. I can't tell you how many times I just stop and don't even bother to correct when they call me Shauna. <laughs> um, so uh, I feel your pain and I apologize. All right. So Steve, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us uh, a little bit about your background, how you kind of ended up where you are. Uh, and tell us a little bit about Mammoth. Sure. Sure. Um, well, thanks again for having me on the show. Uh, it's always really, I look at it as an honor and a privilege to represent our industry and, and be somebody who can really be thought of as a thought leader here. Um, you know, when I first came into the industry of just looking at wealth management or financial services at large, when I was in college, I didn't know what I wanted to study. Like most college students, I, maybe I was a little bit more realistic that I probably knew that I wouldn't work in the industry that I studied. <laughs> and so I chose finance as my major because I I knew I wanted to make money and that's all. And I wanted to know what to do with it, but I hadn't thought of financial services as an industry that I would work in. Um, but I started my career actually in college with Northwestern Mutual, and I went through their internship program, which was incredible sales training. And it introduced me to this industry that I, I pretty quickly fell in love with. You know, the idea of of planning led financial services and um, really finding the need to help people improve their outcomes financially in life uh, became a pretty quick passion for me, and. Um, you know, just to fast forward a little bit after college and after Northwestern Mutual, I ended up in New York City. I grew up in, in California, um, Northern California, Santa Cruz area. And after college, I ended up moving to New York City. And I had the ambitions of going to graduate school there. And while I was uh, waitlisted, I was actually introduced to some guys who were working in a tech incubator um, that was part of NYU Poly. And this is really at the beginning of or during the financial crisis and the the great financial crisis 2008 and they were working on a risk platform and they uh, I got I got familiar with them and we started hanging out and talking about this and I was the I ended up being the first employee of hidden levers um, while we were still in this tech incubator and we're building out this risk platform which you know has evolved into you know, now in our market of taking what was kind of a KYC compliance requirement and turning it into a big part of the building a relationship with your client and setting expectations about the services that are going to be provided. And uh, so that was pretty fun. And so that's kind of how I came into the technology side or service provider to financial services side of the world. Um, really just by accident, moved to New York City with the intent to go to grad school and ended up working in a tech incubator with a couple of guys on a new startup. Well, it's interesting because um, I think one of the things that I find most interesting at Fonrian and what Mammoth is doing is that the teams that started these firms are building solutions for advisors and we've all been advisors. And I right. think that makes it really unique because we understand the business, you know, what's involved, what the day-to-day -day is and kind of what the pain points are. I think that's such a huge differentiator um, you know, when you think about tech platforms that have been developed, um, and I'm sure that helped at Hidden Levers having your insight from when you were at Northwestern Mutual, I mm -hmm. worked at Morgan Stanley as an advisor first. 
Um, and that's how I got into my career. So almost a similar path in that respect and left to go to grad school. Um, but I actually ended up going to Bentley um, and then ended up going back to the financial services industry after that. So I, I think that's a great segue to talk about how you ended up at Mammoth and what Mammoth is doing that I think is so compelling. Yeah. Um, you know, just to, to draw a line there, uh, I spent quite a bit of time at Hidden Levers and our focus was on measuring risk. And, um, you know, that, that conversation evolved a lot and it led me to the next company I worked with, which was Life Yield, um, which is based here in Boston, where I live now. And um, Life Yield, we focused on tax efficiency. And I spent a lot of time there uh, with our team building products and building algorithms and software to help automate and support creating more tax efficiency. And that just led me naturally into being exposed to all the problems and complexity that exist with alternative investments and not just alternatives at large, but specifically the private private investments. And so with Mammoth and my partners at Mammoth, really what we started to uncover is that advisors steer away from this because they don't understand it or they don't know how to scale it. And the thing that attracted me most to it is when we look at the infrastructure that's here to support financial advisors and growing their business, for the most part, it's AUM based. So I'm oversimplifying this, but it's assets under management based. And I have a good understanding in the public markets of what the unit economics are. When I approach a client that has a certain amount of assets to invest with me, I know what it's going to take for me to support that client how quickly I need to scale my team and I can use my AUM as a measuring stick. Hey, we're hitting another benchmark. It's time to start hiring somebody else and we're going to need these resources in place. And I know how much margins built into that. Alternatives in the private markets that doesn't exist. Right. Right. And so it forces advisors who don't have those resources to steer away from it because it's too hard for them to scale. And then God forbid you run into a client who's an awesome prospect, but they have a bunch of private investments and they, they expect you to help service those investments and you don't know what you're getting into. You can bring on a great client that would normally be an awesome opportunity for you to grow your business and you end up upside down in the relationship and no one wants to be there. So that was the problem that we set out to solve. Yeah. I think that's so interesting. So uh, for our audience, Bonnerin and Mammoth um, have started to work together in partnership because we agree uh, on the core issue here. You know, uh, anybody who's listened to me talk and you and I have talked about this a ton knows that I always talk about the reason advisors don't allocate to alternatives at scale are for all the reasons you just talked about. Lack of education, lack of analytical ways in which they can incorporate private products into analytical reports that include public product, reporting issues, very complex subscription documents and investment, uh, actually making the investment, very right. complex in terms of following and monitoring the investment. And then above and beyond that, um, sometimes it can be difficult to bill on. And if mm. you are one of those advisors who is an AUM based advisor, um, you know, that is a hurdle you have to deal with. So all of those things I have found is why advisors don't allocate at scale. And everybody seemed to think that the problem was access. And I don't think it was ever access. It was mm. all those other things. Yeah. No, I mean, access is a hot topic. And look, uh, without access, there's not, none of this other stuff is worth talking about at all. Um, but we have found there's a lot of on-ramps to access, a lot of on-ramps to access, and um, doesn't necessarily satisfy everything. And so to your point, if I'm an advisor who um, has access, but I don't have the education and I don't have the tools to automate it or scale it. Um, I'm probably still not going to head in that direction. And then, you know, not, not to mention when it comes to the data and the billing that you mentioned, um, this is where that lack of scale comes in, where I don't understand those unit economics. Now, all of a sudden I have staff that's going around and gathering and reconciling these paper statements. Like, what are we, is this like, are we back in 1982? Right. Yeah. And so you know, being able to give them a plug and play solution, a platform where they can really start to scale and automate that part of their business. Um, and then, you know, I'll touch on a thing that you and I, I know we connect on, which is when we talk about access to private investments, 
um, a lot of that access is paid for. Right. Right. And, and paid for by who? And so it's become pretty common knowledge now, I think, with how social media has become such a, you know, in the headlines, um, that if you're not paying for it, then you're probably the product. Yep. And so I've really seen this, this idea of access where, well, we have access and it's free, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you have now become the product. And so we really want to partner with financial advisors to help them curate and build a, an intentional alternatives business. Um, not one that's just default that they're being marketed to and, you know, those managers and everybody else is getting paid based on the deal flow that they provide. And it's interesting because philosophically we are completely aligned. That's why Mammoth and Bonrian make so much sense in that mm -hmm. our two solutions complement each other. There's not a lot of overlap. We solve for several different problems. The problems I couldn't solve for with our tech, your tech does and vice right. versa. But to your point, the biggest problem I see is that advisors are largely unhappy with the access platforms that are out there. Mm. They don't feel like they have a ton of options and they don't feel like those those platforms were built off with offerings that are well suited to them. And we've seen this with these large institutions who want to sell to advisors, but don't want to su like support that service. And mm -hmm. they don't have dedicated advisory teams um, and they don't necessarily understand the advisor's business and they're not accessible. Um, you know, those are the ones who are willing and uh, most likely paying for access. We're starting to see that change a little bit, but the question becomes like, if, as you pointed out, if you're not paying for it, that means you're the product. And, you know, philosophically, I believe that the goal with Bonrian and the goal with Mammoth is yes, it's not free, but you are getting service and support and what is being provided for you in terms of the curated list of managers that we put together is well diligenced mm. and focused on making sure that those firms are accessible and are going to service advisors the right way. And I think right. that's worth it, you know, because right. the access platforms that exist, advisors aren't using proactively, they're using them more reactively. Mm -hmm. um, so the focus has to be on you know, how do you solve for that? Um, but understanding that by doing that, that means there's going to be some cost involved. Um, but it's worth it if your goal is to be a good fiduciary to your client and to have a good experience because this is important to you. And then you also touched on the part of like scalability, being able to provide product, you know, that is diversified enough in terms of actual structure that you mm -hmm. can allocate to alts for all your clients. Because I've always felt that that's one of the reasons why advisors don't allocate to alts at scale because the average mass affluent advisor doesn't have their entire book that's qualified or accredited. And they don't wanna have too much complexity for a small amount of accounts, where to your point, they have to hire staff and they're doing all this complex work if they're not gonna allocate to it for everybody so that they can have consistent conversations and they're not trying to get up to date with seven different private equity funds or, you know, for five clients. Um, that, that I think is also a hurdle. So let's talk a little bit about what Mammoth has built because it's pretty cool. And yeah. then we can kind of talk about and let the audience know how our companies are partnering together to help advisors. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, just to talk about it kind of from the uh, beginning, our origin story is, uh, Mammoth's original company, Mammoth Investors, started as an investment company building private private funds. Mm -hmm. And Mammoth Technology came out of that really out of necessity. Uh, we What we found being a wealth management um, centric team was that at the core of bringing an LP into a fund, we wanted to include their financial advisor. And that the the tools required for us to do that as a small fund, um, it was like too much. It was too much for us to a afford right bringing together all these point solutions, and then the user experience was non-existent. It was terrible, and so that's what inspired the idea of Mammoth Technology. We started with creating an onboarding platform where we could digitize subscription documents, 
Um, but on top of just digitizing subscription documents for a fund manager, um, how do we take that and relate it so that a financial advisor can access that and white label it and control the experience for the LP? Because that's what that's what we felt was the most important is putting the financial advisor at the center of this transaction, mm -hmm. not just from the introduction, but also all the way through the paperwork and then the servicing of that paperwork. Mm -hmm. And so we started with that IR solution for funds. Um, today, we can digitize those subscription documents. We maintain the investor profile. We have an investor portal with a document vault where those LPs can come and retrieve all their tax documents and their completed subscriptions and updates on the fund itself. Um, and then we also tie into fund administration. So if, if you want to launch a new fund, we have the fund admin built in there as well. And, um, you know, that's the way that we kind of took that from a fund manager and got into wealth management as we started finding all these firms who wanted to pull client assets. They weren't necessarily going to launch their own private equity fund or their own VC fund. Um, but the use of special purpose vehicles, SPVs, um, became very, it was, a, it was an awesome tool for them to pull these client assets to make a single investment. And um, they needed it to be more scalable. And so kind of going from our framework of servicing fund managers to helping wealth managers build and launch SPVs and service those funds over time is what led us to where we are today, which is building out our advisor portal and our advisor platform where, um, where you and I have partnered. Because when we look at the SPVs, well, next thing you know, I got three SPVs that I'm servicing and these clients have other alternative exposure, whether I place them there or not. So how do we bring that all into one place for them to see, but also how do they introduce new deal flow? Right. You know, I'm an advisor under a large firm and like golfing with my client and they introduced me to this new venture opportunity or a new private equity or private credit deal. I want to allocate to it. I bring it to my advisor. What's the advisor supposed to do with that? Mm -hmm. They want to help their client, but they don't know what the next step is. Right. Yeah. And that's the interesting part. So, um, one of the cool things about the partnership that we're doing is that, you know, on our side, we do all the due diligence and we really do vet and curate this list um, to ensure that the advisors have all the information they need to make that educated choice. So in the scenario you just talked about, that advisor could go to Mammoth and say, look, I have this all set up, but my client just came to me with this random thing and I, I don't know even where to begin. And that is where Bonrian could come in. But above and beyond that, um, as I mentioned before, our two systems complemented e each other. When yeah. I when I kind of had a vision for Bonner and I really wanted it to be like the most seamless way for advisors to allocate to alternatives across the board, from the liquid alt side with the models to you know the more esoteric um, you know mm -hmm. capital call vehicles and everything in between um, for clients that are accredited, qualified, not accredited, and. Part of that vision was providing the analytics, the education, the due diligence. We were able to build that out well. What we weren't able to do was the second part, which is all of the operational and compliance and the integrations with the traditional software uh, and tools that advisors use to do their reporting and their client reviews, their householding, to your point, the digitization of those documents. And that is where Mammoth, excels so mm -hmm. from that standpoint with our partnership we're able to provide the advisor from start to finish and then it's a it's a really nice feedback loop yeah. because once an investment is made and now we're getting real-time performance data that yeah. goes right back into our solution so that those analytics can be used uh, and create reporting um, and snapshots and hypotheticals and everything of that nature and then and your system can be integrated with your regular reporting. I think that's yeah. really compelling. And I don't think there's anything like that out there. You know, we share that passion. And I'd love if you could talk a little bit about that, how Mammoth does integrate with like the Orions and the Black Diamonds and the whole process of digitizing subscription documents. Because let's start from the basics. Uh -huh. For advisors who are listening, who don't who have never allocated to a private fund, you know, what's that process look like? What are the documents involved? What is the operational process? Why is the digitization that you're doing so important? Yeah. 
and I'll, I'll start, and this is maybe the most obvious answer and probably the most frustrating, which is that it depends on which private investment because they're all different. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's part of the, the issue is that there's no standard forms. There's no um, standardization across which, I mean, there's, there's basic requirements of what you need to collect. Mm -hmm. um, but that's it. Other than that, it's the wild west. And so the digitization of the forms comes in where you can create a standardized repeatable process that you drive. Um, so digitizing that experience, A, it reduces friction because normally when you get a PPM or a subscription agreement, which you're super familiar with, right? That's like mm -hmm. first, that's step one of uh, doing due diligence. Right. Um, you're, you're looking at a hundred plus page document. And so getting through that and making sure that we're filling it out the correct way, I can't tell you how many uh, fund managers or advisors I've talked to where they are trying to help a client go through this process and they have to go back to the table. They send it in for signature, not in good order, right? Like now I go back, yep. you need to sign here or you filled this section out incorrectly or this section. So digitizing that and just being a little bit more intelligent and intentional about guiding you, you know, hey, I am going to make this investment through my LLC. Great. We're going to jump right to filling out all the required information for your LLC so that you don't accidentally fill out the wrong section. Happens all the time and it seems obvious, but um, that's where we really needed to start with the subscription documents. And then again, I think by from a firm's perspective, when you can own that experience, now you become a valuable and critical part of that transaction for your client. Or if I throw the ball over the fence and I just introduce you to a GP and have you work directly with them, I've lost control of the relationship, you know, and, you know, from a financial advisor, sometimes that's a conscious and intentional decision, right? This is going to be an ancillary part of my business. It's not how I'm going to scale. I want to help you, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to grow this way. So here, go do this by yourself. Um, but for a lot of us, we want, we know that allocations to alternatives and privates is growing and it's becoming more necessary. I mean, just, just look at it. When we, when I was at hidden levers, we had a screening tool and we used to laugh at how many people would search for private, for private companies looking for the ticker symbol. Right. And that's kind of where you come in. I was laughing the first time I saw your platform because I'm like, man, having that back then is, is just such a powerful tool to be able to blend private investments with your public and see how that changes you know, the risk analytics and statistics associated with your portfolio is such a cool thing. Yeah. And it's always hard to do because private investments don't report daily. So right. you have to in, normalize the data to get the information you need. And, you know, the analytical tools that we offer automatically do that, right. automatically normalize. Whereas some of the more robust ones that are out there that institutions use, you have to like tell it to normalize. Um, you have to point out the frequency because it's always different. Ours just, it might be weekly, it could be monthly, it could be quarterly. Our system automatically recognizes it and then normalizes it so that everything is aligned. To your point, that's a big deal. Um, you know, you touched upon like the digitization process, but let's talk about the pre-population um, aspects of it because that's a big yeah. deal. You know, for an advisor who might come on Vonrian uh, and find a manager they really like, and mm -hmm. they go to make the investment, but they have like five clients they're interested in. You know, right. what you guys do with that pre-population and those integrations with those service providers, yep. I think is what is actually the key to this being such an efficient process. Yeah, hundred percent. So, you know, at the core, we understood the wealth management industry and and we've been along for the ride a lot, the whole way and integration is key. And so we knew that if we built Mammoth and it was a, a standalone system that was isolated that didn't integrate that we weren't going to make it very far. Um, at, at our core beliefs, if we look at where we think the puck is going, I think more and more wealth management firms want to own their data. And we're seeing these trends where people are building out their own um, data warehouses, et cetera. And so being able to integrate and be flexible with that. So at the core, your CRM and your Orion, you have a list of your clients, you have pretty much all the information we need to complete a subscription document across two or three of your systems today. Mm -hmm. And so building out those integrations and building out an investor profile is where we can get started. So if I'm in your system 
and I find a fund manager and that fund manager has partnered with Mammoth, you can jump right into Mammoth, select the client that you want to invest or the five clients, launch those subscription agreements. We're going to pre-populate it. You go through and review, make sure it's accurate. And then you can go ahead and send that out for signature. Right? So it's literally that simple, or it can be that simple. And then now once that investment's been made, now what? You know, we talk to advisors all the time and they say, oh, well, those investments are just being reported from Schwab. I made the investment on Schwab. Well, I don't think it's a secret that Schwab treats most of these private investments just like a public investment. And to your point, they're only going to report the change in the value of the investment. Mm -hmm. So along the way, when there's these transactions that occur and there's there's changes, whether it's um, a capital call or um, there's a return of capital or there's a payment that's made, none of that's showing up. And so you actually need to go and interpret those statements. And so that's where our portal comes in is where you know, all of those daily transactions that occur across the book are all made transparent. It's digitized. It's available for you, your client, their CPA, as well as all those documents so that they can come retrieve it all in one place. And um, and then we push that right back into, into your system so that they can go ahead and look at how that changes the portfolio. It's pretty beautiful. Yeah, it's it's actually, you know, genius. <laughs> Two of us. And then, and then I'll just say that we got to get that back into your reporting system, right? It has to be back in your reporting system. That's, that's where you're doing your fee billing, mm -hmm. right? So this, this chain around all the private investments is what allows you as the financial advisor to say, look, I'm demonstrating value. I'm reporting on these investments accurately. We're create we're doing work that creates transparency for you as a client, as an investor, and make it simpler for you to understand your net worth and make it better for us to do our planning, we've earned our fee. Exactly. Right? And how you set up that fee structure is totally up to you. But now you have a system in place where you can show, look, we can help you with your alternatives. We exactly. can help you with those investments. We can help you onboard to new ones and we can help you with the ones that you've already made. Yeah. I, I just love the like fact that cap calls, being able to track cap calls, uh, right. It's amazing because you can set ticklers for yourself. Oh, I have to raise cash in such and such account because I have a capital call coming up. Um, yeah. For our audience who may not understand that term, that's with these private vehicles. You make an initial investment and then as the fund ramps up and they have things to invest in, they will call capital into the fund until it's fully raised. So you commit the capital, but you don't necessarily invest and wire the money all at the same right. time. So right. there will be times where there will be capital calls that you need to be aware of so that you make sure that your client has enough cash in their account to, you know, meet the the call that they're getting uh, to meet the commitment that they made in terms of right. investment wise. That and today, is important. And today, a lot of the systems out there, when we talk about access, mm -hmm. again, you become the product. You introduced an LP to a GP and you're not even being notified when there's a capital call. Right. Same thing with the, tax documents. How exactly. many, there are planners out there that do tax planning. I, I, I know personally, we've talked to several advisors who are also CPAs. You know, if the K-1 is being sent to the client, then you have to, what if it gets lost in the mail? What happens if the client forgets to tell you? What happens if you forgot, because you have 10 clients, you forgot to check in and now you're doing their taxes and you're like, oh shoot, and they're looking for it. The K-1s mm -hmm. go right into the system so you can see them too. Um, so right. all of those things I think are such game changers. And, you know, right. you mentioned the access platforms that are out there now, you know, they certainly open the door to help advisors un understand that this was even an option. And right. they have certainly played a really important role in opening up and making alternatives accessible. But what they lack is that thoughtfulness of how advisors' businesses are run and what those mm -hmm. pain points are in all aspects everything from, like you said, the capital calls or the K-1s, you as the advisor want to have control or at least know what's going on at all times. And the systems that exist today don't, don't have, don't allow for that. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy to think about. I, I mean, if I'm a client and I come to you and you help me make an investment and then you're calling me and you're like, Hey, did you get a capital calls statement and email from fund XYZ? Mm-hmm. Like all of a sudden, I'm, wait, I have to do work? Like, why am I paying you? <laughs> right. I have to do work. 
Exactly. I thought I don't want to do work. And uh, so now it starts, now it puts me in a position where as a client, I'm questioning the value I get from this relationship. Mm -hmm. Right. And I don't ever want to be in a position like that as a financial advisor. I always want my clients to feel like they're getting way more value from our relationship than they're paying for. Right. And if I call them, always asking them to go do work, to look in their email address or look in their email inbox for something, or did you get something in the mail that you didn't send to me? Now, all of a sudden it's, it's flipping the script there. I don't want to do that. I want to be at the center of the transaction. I want to be aware of all the communication between the GP and the LP. I want to be able to set that up so that I can be proactive and say, Hey, we already got that taken care of. Hey, I got this email. Do you need this? Nope. Got it taken care of. We're all set. Exactly. And the other thing I think is really interesting is Mammoth's platform and ours are quite scalable. So, you know, if you're a small independent advisor, that CPA that has a small book of business and you want to use this, you can use our platform. But if you're a huge aggregator and you want to make it available to your clients and have more control, you can do that too with the white label enterprise level where mm -hmm. you can control what your advisors see. You can see the due diligence. You can make sure that it meets your criteria like what the TAMPs have been doing for a long time. Right. I always like to say that when I built Bonnery and it was because I helped build the foundation for what is now the Orion TAMP. And advisors like to interact with tools that are comfortable. And mm -hmm. so if I could build my platform to feel like a TAMP and not like an access platform, then right. it would be easier for them to adopt. And I think what you guys did feels the same way. Mm -hmm. No, yeah. That's... No, I think intentional design and, you know, um, some of our partners here at Mama spent quite a bit of time at Orion as well. And I think that when it comes down to how, not just Orion, but when we look across, I think it's pretty remarkable, you know, when we think of how the industry has developed, um, 15, 20 years ago, the center of an advisor's business was their custodian. Mm -hmm. And today the custodial relationships, I feel like, um, Maybe they're becoming more more relevant recently. There's some new new entrants, but it shifted to becoming the centerpiece was your accounting system. Mm -hmm. Like how crazy is that? Right. Like go go Eric Clark, man, to take an a, to take an accounting system and say, hey, you should build your entire business around this. Yeah, what Orion built and what you see with some of the other providers in that space is not just an accounting system. It's an accounting system, a CRM system, a right. reporting system, a compliance system. All of that is in it. Um, yeah. And, you know, it makes it really easy for advisors and for uh, firms, you know, even large independent broker dealers use these. Um, and it al also allows those larger firms to have that control mm -hmm. where, you know, they, they want to make sure that they're providing that oversight that advisors, you know, join them for, you know, right. we've, we've talked on our own and we definitely talk about this sometimes with asset managers more than anything um, about how there's different types of advisors. There's the ones that work with a BD. There's mm -hmm. the fully independent REAs. There's the hybrids. And so understanding that and, you know, what's involved and why an advisor would choose each one is an important part of understanding how that advisor approaches business, um, which I think is a good segue into talking about, we've talked about a lot why our partnership and you know what we offer is great for the advisor. But I think more importantly, um, you know, why it's great for the asset manager. As we mentioned, you know, we don't want the advisor to be the product. So mm -hmm. we at least at Bonnery and, and I know um same with Mammoth, we kind of function as thinking it more of it like a fee to be on the platform, you know, a fee to maintain like those connections, that technology, that oversight that we do. Mm -hmm. um, but we aren't third-party marketers. Neither one of us are third-party marketers. And um, a lot of time, these asset managers will be like, well, then why would I join you? Because the traditional access platforms have acted more like third-party marketers. Right. Some sort of guarantee and some sort of incentive to push funds and get assets. And, you know, thinking about like the ROI on something like that, a lot of asset managers ask like, why would I bother if you can't guarantee me the flow? Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, we've talked about this before. There's a reason it makes sense to do something like this. And maybe you can touch upon how 
there's a real benefit to it, uh, a fund manager or a, an asset manager to be on the platform in this way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even if we just go back to the last, one of the hurdles that are faced is capital calls. Mm -hmm. Um, if I'm a GP or a fund manager and I'm sending out my capital calls directly to my LPs and they're being missed or they can't honor it or it takes too long, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's not an awesome experience. If all I have to do is to be on a platform and partner with, you know, a partner like Banrian and, and Mammoth. And now the investments that are made through that platform, I know are going to be followed up with by their financial advisor, who is the quarterback and the coach on all the finances is going to have a workplace or a, um, a workflow in place to take care of capital calls. Why wouldn't I sign up for that? When I can partner with us to digitize my onboarding and make it easier for a financial advisor to allocate money to my fund. Why wouldn't I sign up for that? Right. You know, when I see all of the hurdles that are in place that people are tripping over to allocate to my fund, if I can eliminate that, through a flat fee that doesn't create a, a conflict for the advisor. Cause that, you know, today when I go out there and I see these fund managers who approach it, like, no, it's tit for tat, right? Like I'll, I'll, I'll we'll have, we'll share in a success fee that creates a conflict. It creates a conflict for the financial advisor to go recommend the product immediately. It's the same thing that we deal with, with commissions. It's all it is. Right. And so how do we eliminate that conflict to make it easier? And we believe that, that with our platform, we've done that. I agree wholeheartedly. And I think the other thing is as our, our integration grows and as more and more advisors join, there's going to be this desire because there's so much flexibility to it for advisors to kind of make it what they want it to be. Mm -hmm. there, there will eventually become a point where why would they bother going outside of the ecosystem and making things more complex when their entire workflow and their business can be very efficient and streamlined in a way. You know, you didn't touch upon this, but it made me think of it when you were talking about capital calls. Another great, um, you know, attribute of Mammoth is the fact that you can actually create ACH uh, transactions to yeah. send the funds for your client. Yeah. How many times? I can't even tell you, I've talked to advisors who have been frustrated because they get through all of the documents, but then they got to give their client and say, like, go to your bank and create right. the wire. Like right. there's no sense of urgency at that point. The client's like, yeah, whenever I get to it, they're not like excited to like, you know, move the money or give the permission, yeah. whatever. But like the advisor has to put that again, to your point, another task for the client to do. And you can't control when it's going to happen. Uh, right. And it can oftentimes, it's not a priority for the client. It's a priority for you as the advisor. You want to get the investment made. You want to, the timing. The client might be like, yeah, I'll get to the bank when I get to the bank or I'll log in when I get there. And maybe they even forget. But right. all the systems that exist today, you have to rely on the client to do that. And within Mammoth system, you don't. Right. Nope. You can you can set it up right from in the system as part of onboarding, um, ACH, wire, if you're doing a check. Um, all the KYC AML OFAC check that's required is built in. So that's all automated. Fund managers should be moving in this direction. And I think, you know, you think of it more and more. If you could talk to any fund manager for the most part, you know, if you look at like the run of the mill, they don't approach this industry because it's too expensive for them to build relationships. It's right? also a completely different service model that they're not, it, yeah. it would be, and they'd have to, potentially hire new people. You know, that was one of the things that when Bonrian went to market and when I started talking to asset managers, we wanted to be their resource to help understand the market so that they could effectively service it. But mm -hmm. if you're a asset manager who's always had institutional clients, the service model and the sales approach to the advisor market is completely different and you can't yeah. take the same approach. Yeah. And that's exactly what I'm getting at is that, um, you know, this isn't just like the traditional throw money at it wholesale, put somebody on a plane model. Um, the, the world has changed. And so allocating to these products needs a lot more automation. It needs, you know, we have to think data first. We have to think complexity and long-term relationship management. And so mm -hmm. if I like your product, but it's going to be a pain for me to honor the deal I made with my client long-term, it's a no, it's a non-starter.
The other thing it solves for is a lot of asset managers don't approach the market because they just don't custody at Mm. the places the advisors custody. You know, it wasn't until the last 18 months that Schwab started to really build out their private fund Mm -hmm. uh, platform. Fidelity's had one forever, but it's complex to get on those. Um, Fidelity, for example, it's actually not that hard to get on and they've been doing this robustly, but a fund manager can't go and request it. The Mm. advisor has to. So yeah. if a fund manager wants to be on the Fidelity private funds platform, they can't just go to Fidelity and be like, hey, I want to custody and have be available on your pl- platform. It actually has to become a request from the advisor saying, hey, I want to use this fund on the platform, which right. you know makes it more difficult. And Schwab is still working the kinks out. You know, I've heard from advisors that it's a little clunky. It doesn't update as much as they would like. It's not as robust as they'd like, like you see at Fidelity. And again, same thing. It has to come from the request of the advisor. So then the problem becomes if the asset manager doesn't custody at Fidelity or Schwab, which they probably don't because those are not traditional places a hedge fund private equity would custody. Those guys tend to custody at things like Mellon, BNY, Mm -hmm. um, and, and firms of that nature, JP Morgan, you know, that's who their custody is. It's that's traditionally what the custody would be because right. there's services involved like prime brokerage. They tend to uh, custody with, you know, investment banks who can offer those additional services. And now there's a mismatch making it harder for the advisors to your point to invest because they don't custody where you custody. So that means it's not ever going to show up on your Schwab statement or fidelity statement. Right. And you can't streamline it into your back office solution either. And in many right. ways, this is kind of a workaround for you know those managers to start working with the advisors and take that headache out, but at the same time, start to work towards being able to get on those platforms as well. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, these large fund uh, fund managers, hundred percent, should be working towards being on those custodial platforms and the custodial platforms, which I imagine they will. They're starting to will be opened up to, obviously. Um, as their workflows get more ironed out, opened up to this whole ecosystem. You know, we, we saw a lot of movement in the last 10 years around um, open architecture. TD Ameritrade was a, they were a leader on that front. I imagine that same policy is going to be adopted by Schwab, um, but we're seeing it more and more. But when it comes down to like private allocations, when it comes to an advisor, you have this infrastructure when you want to recommend something. And I think it's a good press best practice to pay attention to where are these assets custodied? What's the protocol there? How do I fulfill that? And do I have a system in place to, to do it? But I promise when you get into that ultra high net worth, high net worth, ultra high net worth range, those clients, those investors are being thrown deal flow left and right all the time. And it's not these big funds that you're going to find on Schwab. It's direct investments in startup companies, right? Mm-hmm. They're they're getting pitched with angel opportunities constantly, um, small VC deals, and it's all these things that are coming at them left and right. And so, how do you service all of it? How do you bring it all together? How do you measure it? You got to have you got to have your own system in place. No fund manager is going to take care of that for you. Yeah, and and I think that's yeah. just such an important point. You know. Um, I, I think what I find most interesting is, you know, the efficiencies, but you touched upon this other part, which is important. There's an essence of feeling confident in the viability of a manager that is using certain technology protocols or service providers. So you touched about it in custody, but you know, when we do our due diligence at Bonrian on any manager, we focus on who are their service providers? Who do they, right. who's their TPA? How, 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 do, because you want to see that they're with legitimate, well known, high quality service providers. It's always a red flag if you see somebody changing their TPA all the time or their legally, uh, legal counsel, you know, but you want to see some consistency there, right? So when you work with a manager who has gone through the process of integrating and working with Mammoth, there's a level of confidence you can feel because Mammoth. Uh, does some due diligence on that operational side. Like who's the TPA? Who's the Mm. legal counsel? I imagine you guys have some like level of, 
I don't, I've never heard of this CPA. We've never worked with him. Sorry, you can't be on the platform. And that should give advisors confidence too, that from the front end investment due diligence and the back end operational due diligence, Mammoth and Bondrian are working together to ensure that what is available to you, you yep. can feel really good at as a fiduciary. Yeah, hundred percent. And, and, you know, just to close that thought, um, a big part of our partnership with Bondrian is being able to make due diligence accessible. You know, when we first started our, when we were helping these firms build out their own funds and they asked about getting due diligence done and we went out there and looked, you know, a lot of the firms were looking at having to pay a pretty large retainer with a big institutional due diligence company, and they would get access to this library or reports that they didn't need. They don't have deal flow that, that that's that big, right? Mm -hmm. They need more pointed solutions and, and real people who they can build a relationship and rely on. And so we've built out the integration where firms, when you do come across a deal and you need due diligence, or if there's something in the mammoth catalog that you say, hey, I want to run this past, past my team at Bonrean, one click, you can push that over, request a due diligence report. And assuming you have a relationship with both of us, Shana's team gets working on it. And once the due, due diligence re report is available, it's available on both systems. Yep. And, um, you know, it's, it's, I think, thoughtful workflows like that, that really will help an advisor kind of streamline this area of their practice and help them grow with alternatives. And I think That's it helps the aggregators too. Yep. Uh, as oh, you and yeah. I have both found a lot of the aggregators, they do have alts teams. They're not big. Advisors are now more and more interested in alts. So their alts teams are getting inundated with requests about this manager, that manager. My client came to me with this. They have like two people and they can't handle it. So mm -hmm. I've talked to firms, big firms that are like, we have a one year backlog on mm -hmm. due diligence requests. Yeah. So having that mechanism at which they can have a complementary team supporting them, I think is really important <clears throat> in this space because we know the demand is there. Now there's mm -hmm. one last thing I really wanted to touch upon and it really is more in the vein of the asset manager. Um, <clears throat> you know, We had some conversations recently with some asset managers where they kind of were not on board with the idea of the mass affluent market. And I think it's really important that we highlight that this is a m massive market and opportunity. Oh, yeah. That has been completely overlooked. Mm -hmm. And these advisors actually want these products. They, they view it as not even now. No, it is no longer a way to differentiate yourself. It is a must have. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about, you know, why this market is so important and why you know, advisors are asking for these products for their clients in this space. So without trying to claim like some kind of crazy expertise or insights that if I just go back to my original experience at Hidden Levers where we had this screener and we have advisors, advisors mm -hmm. looking for ticker symbols of companies that are private. <laughs> that is a, that is the canary in the coal mine. Right. The private market is growing. Mm -hmm. Access to is growing. I mean, we're talking to managers where we're bringing on private funds and they're launching interval products. Yeah. Well, there's a large asset manager we're talking to right now that is has a very robust, long history in the hedge fund world. Yeah. Also has a suite of mutual funds that are yeah. in the same space and they want to have a place where both those things can be available and accessible, but with the ability to access these types of strategies, you know, as a younger couple mm -hmm. grows in their wealth, they get really comfortable with these types of strategies through the liquid form. And eventually they're going to want to move over to the more efficient, greater, uh, you know, excess return possibility, more yeah. uh, potential alpha of the less liquid things, but also having conversations about liquidity, liquidity budgets, yeah. alpha of liquidity, all those things are part of that, but it's what's happening in that mass affluent market right now. Yeah, no, it's a hundred percent. And and it's what's happening in the mass affluent market. And I'll tell you, I was just in a meeting the other day where liquidity risk um, was kind of the topic of discussion. And it was a very obvious, but great point that was made, which the question that was posed is when will you start dealing with retirement assets? Mm -hmm. We're constantly making recommendations and allocating money to non-liquid vehicles like an IRA. So if I'm a young couple and I'm advising for a young couple in their forties and we're making allocations in their IRA, sure, we might be able to buy and sell, but that money is locked up until retirement without a substantial fee. If you need to access it outside of that IRA account, 
And so as we make these allocations, we're already doing it. It's just a matter of ourselves looking at that liquidity as which most have come to to view as an asset, right? Exactly. So something not repricing so frequently and not having liquidity um, can create stability in a portfolio, which you and I understand. And I think more and more mass affluent is coming along to that. And now more than ever, I just saw a um, an article I believe it was New York Times, maybe it was Wall Street Journal, but the title of the article was what does it take to be in the 1%? Right. Right. So what are based on your income are you in the top 1%? The entire article was about the type of investments the 1% are making that are illiquid or in the alt space. Mm -hmm. It was all about real estate. It was all about getting increased yield in private credit and private debt. It was yep. all about private equity and the maturity of private equity and the access that that gets you when we think of diversification um, that isn't available in public markets because the public markets are shrinking, yep. right? Not necessarily in size as, as far as assets, but in size as demographics across our country. And so it's pretty interesting. It's becoming a lot more mainstream. And I think advisors being at the forefront of that and how they create access and how they manage the transactions is going to be the key. It's really going to be the key. No, completely agree. I, I, I completely agree. I, I... There's so much complexity here, you know, tax planning, liquidity budgeting, uh, you know, risk budgeting. Um, and then I think if you were to talk to behavioral uh, finance folks like a Daniel Crosby or a mm. Brian Portnoy, they would also say that, you know, from a psychological standpoint as an advisor, having some things in the portfolio that don't price daily actually psychologically is a good thing for the client. Um, mm. They're not constantly watching the movement and freaking out and having that, you know, emotional response when things aren't going their way, because you can't. And right. it, it's, it's, there's, there's a psychological benefit to, to that type of thing as well. Yeah, absolutely. And then, but, and then not to mention that you just, you can't make the gut reaction. So right. you have the psychological, but then you're also restricted from having the gut reaction where all of a sudden I can't deal with it. I'm going to pull the plug. Yep. It prevents us from getting our own way too. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I did um, uh, the compound and friends podcast and Michael Batnick was talking about like, if he had to be like stuck in investment for 10 years and he couldn't look at it, like, how would he feel? And he was like, I'd love that. And mm -hmm. I think there's something to be said about, you know, it, it kind of prevents you from making your own bad decisions Yeah, exactly. Uh, in that respect. But um, I really want to thank you for being with me today, um, for taking this time. I'm really excited about our partnership. I, I really yeah. do think what we're doing is so amazing. And um, we've already been talking to advisors and getting excellent feedback. And even with the asset managers, the entire process for them has been really remarkable. They they comment about how easy it's been, how high level the service has been. I know we yeah. uh, referred one of our managers over to you guys and he raves about how quickly you guys get back to him, how often you communicate, and how easy the entire process was for them to get up and running and feel like they were well supported. And I think mm -hmm. anybody who chooses to do business with us will find that that's kind of like, you know, our core philosophy is, you know, the point of both of our firms building what we built was to have a good experience. And number one way to have a good experience is to have good service. Um, right. And so that's, you know, that's one of the key things that both our firms really focus on. Um, so tell us where we can find you, um, and where people can find information about Mammoth. Um, and I'll also put it in the notes underneath the, uh, the episode. Um, but, um, feel free to tell our audience where they can find you. Awesome. Well, me personally, find me on LinkedIn. It's the only place I am. <laughs> I'm kind of old school that way. And you then, are. um, mammothtechnology.com. Awesome. Look us well, up. And uh, we'd love to meet with you. We'd love to answer your questions. And uh, we have uh, great resources on the website. So feel free to browse that. And if you want to talk, my calendar link's right there on the website. Yep. And I'll also put a link in uh, the uh, episode notes um, where advisors or asset managers can sign up to get a demo if they want to see um, the technology um, and get a feel for it. Um, I'm just going to throw it out there because, you know, my marketing hat is on, but um, as we are launching this technology, especially on the advisor side, we're certainly looking for advisors who are interested in helping us 
ensure that the technology is what we want it to be. You can't, mm -hmm. we call them beta testers, but the whole point is we think we built something great, but until people are actually using it every day, we'll never know if it's actually meeting what we want. So if you're an advisor who finds what we're talking about compelling and want to be part of that group that helps us ensure that this is exactly what we want it to be and the experience exactly what we hope it will be, you know, please reach out. We'll put a link in uh, the notes uh, to set up that as well. Great. Thanks, Shannon. Thanks for having me. Thank you. The opinions expressed on the What's the Alternative podcast are for general informational purposes only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual or in any specific security. This is only intended to provide education about the financial industry. To determine which investments may be appropriate for you, consult your financial advisor prior to investing. Any past performance discussed during this podcast is no guarantee of future results. The guests featured on this program are participants on Bonrian Capital Management's platform. As such, Bonrian may receive payment for their participation as a platform partner. Any indices referenced for comparison are unmanaged and cannot be invested into directly. As always, please remember investing involves risk and possible loss of principal capital. Please seek advice from a licensed investment professional. Investments are not FDINC insured, nor are they deposits of or guaranteed by a bank or any other entity, so they may lose value. Investors should carefully consider investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses. This and other important information is contained in the fund prospectus and summary prospectuses, which can be obtained from a financial professional and should be read carefully before investing. Statements attributed to an individual represent the opinions of that individual as of the date of the published podcast and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Bonnie and Capital Management or its affiliates. This information is intended to provide educational value, highlight issues, and should not be considered advice, an endorsement, or a recommendation. All Bonnie and Capital trademarks mentioned are owned by Bonnie and Capital Management Inc., an affiliated company, or its funds. All other company and product names mentioned are the property of their respective companies. The opinions expressed on the What's the Alternative podcast are for general informational purposes only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual or in any specific security. This is only intended to provide education about the financial industry. To determine which investments may be appropriate for you, consult your financial advisor prior to investing. Any past performance discussed during this podcast is no guarantee of future results. The guests featured on this program are participants on Bonrian Capital Management's platform. As such, Bonrian may receive payment for their participation as a platform partner. Any indices referenced for comparison are unmanaged and cannot be invested into directly. As always, please remember investing involves risk and possible loss of principal capital. Please seek advice from a licensed investment professional. Investments are not FDINC insured, nor are they deposits of or guarantees by a bank or any other entity, so they may lose value. Investors should carefully consider investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses. This and other important information is contained in the fund prospectus and summary prospectuses, which can be obtained from a financial professional and should be read carefully before investing. Statements attributed to an individual represent the opinions of that individual as of the date of the published podcast and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Bonnery and Capital Management or its affiliates. This information is intended to provide educational value, highlight issues, and should not be considered advice, an endorsement, or a recommendation. All Bonnery and Capital trademarks mentioned are owned by Bonnery and Capital Management, Inc., an affiliated company, or its funds. All other company and product names mentioned are the property of their respective companies.